we, sh we can get going. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us for the latest GB Insights Genetic Medicine webinar series. Today we welcome Dr. Ar Arthur Agassin, who'll give us a presentation uh, titled Solving Clinical Dilemmas Using Genetic Testing. Um, quick uh, background, uh, Dr. Agassin, Dr. Agassin is a pioneer in the study and practice of cardiovascular medicine. Uh, his previous work in the co-development of the non-invasive imaging-based tool to quantify calcium calcified plaque is now is that is known as the Agassin score or the coronary uh, the coronary artery calcium score helped usher in the field of preventive cardiology. Uh, Dr. Agassin has co-authored over two hundred scientific papers and is a New York Times best-selling author in nutrition. Um, Dr. Agassin is currently principal clinician and chief executive officer at the Agassin Center for Preventive Medicine in South Florida. Um, first, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we'll have a few minutes at the end of Dr. Agustin's presentation for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom browser. Um, we'll try to get to everyone's questions while also being cognizant of Dr. Agustin's time. This webinar is also being recorded and a copy of it will be available on the GB Insight webinar page uh, within a few days. Um, so let's get started. So Dr. Agustin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mendel. And, you know, I'm going to really start by partly thanking you for what you've contributed to my clinical practice. And my, uh, because of my involvement in starting the, the, the calcium scan, the calcium score, I tend to get consultations of people with very high scores. But one of the things we've learned over time is the preventive cardiology, healthy aging is really spreading. And an issue is people are coming from all different silos and not enough of the, of the subspecialties are, are being integrated for clinical practice. So um, since we've been doing the genetics the last two, three years, it's added a huge amount to our practice. Um, but part is because of the way we use it with, with imaging, with insulin sensitivity measures, um, and other uh, components of, of prevention. So besides genetics, the first prevention in cardiology were always called lipid clinics. And it was really about cholesterols and relatively rare, often monogenic issues like familial hypertension. Of familial hypercholesterolemia, and um, and uh, now there's so much more advanced lipid testing that we we use, and uh, again there's genetic causes for everything we find. Metabolic health has become really really important. Uh, we have new measures that we we do that nutrition, fitness, and every all of these mix, and as I'll tell you, I think they're all from the same cause. And the way we start with patients is we look at the atherosclerotic burden, which is the calcium score. And now we're using a, a new technology, which I'll show you, um, and insulin sensitivity and beta cell function, which we measure with what we call the Kraft test. It's, um, uh, it's, it's an insulin stimulation test. And the thing about both the atherosclerotic burden and insulin sensitivity, when you measure it the right way, you see abnormalities 20, 30 years before you have a clinical event. And you can follow biomarkers so you know how your treatment is working. And the genetics has been a big component. And what we like to do is, is separate into primarily lifestyle um, which is the metabolic health. And we learn a lot from the insulin sensitivity testing. And one of the things we know is if you're heading for diabetes uh, classified by an abnormal glucose tolerance test or an A1C of 6.5 or prediabetes 5.7, um, if you look 20, 30 years before, somebody's heading for diabetes in their 60s or 70s, they will have abnormal insulin secretion in their 20s even if they're thin. And so that's early, uh, you know, that's early detection. And what we realize is the metabolic health has to do with all of what we call the diseases of Western civilization. Um, 
And it's really interesting in one way that uh, Dr. Jason Fung, who's, uh, who's very much uh, in nutrition, intermittent fasting, he's called the metabolic disease, the early, the soil. And almost all Americans have elements of what we call metabolic syndrome, uh, like 93%. So it's almost everybody. But without the soil, if you look at hunter-gatherer societies or pre-industrial societies, uh, they, uh, the, the seeds, which are the genetics, we say that the genes load the gun, the environment pulls the trigger. In those pre-industrial societies, when the trigger hasn't been pulled, uh, the genetics are not that important. And a good example of that, it's really all the big cities um, in the East now, but Beijing in the 1970s, everybody was riding bikes. They were all thin, essentially no diabetes, no coronary disease, and none of the other Western diseases also. Well, Beijing today, between McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, all the traffic, the smog, it's actually showing a very clear day there in Beijing, that's very unusual. Um, but Chinese, their kids today are overweight. And in China, again, they're, they're, they're getting as much diabetes or more diabetes than we are, not in the countryside, but in the cities. Um, and they're also seeing all these other diseases associated with metabolic health. So the, the cost eventually, if we don't diagnose and find the best way to treat this early, is it's it's going to be uh, really overwhelming. Um, and one uh, conceptual approach from uh, Michael Blaha, which I've always liked, is the way we do prevention today, too much is it's a one-time measurement. So you see the doctor at 50, they say, we got to check your cholesterol and blood pressure and put you into a Framingham algorithm or some other algorithm and predict your chance of having an event in the next, say, 10 years. Well, you know, most people are interested in not just when they're 60, but they were 70 or 80, and lifetime risk. And the one-time measurements don't account for risk factor exposure over the first 50 years of life. So if it's LDL weight, it could be all over the place. Um, if it's genetics, like familial hypercholesterolemia, LP little a, PCSK9 abnormalities, that's continuous exposure over time. And that's why we know that a monogenic familial hypercholesterolemia is more, uh, is more dangerous than just having a high cholesterol when you're 50 or 60, because it's this continuous uh, uh, duration of risk factor exposure. And the longer your risk factor exposure, the higher your risk. And we know from cases of familial hypercholesterolemia that when they treat the children, which they discover because the parent had a heart attack at a young age, they do much better than the parents who were invariably untreated until they had a heart attack. So early diagnosis and treatment absolutely save save lives. And we've seen a lot of examples of that. So how can we determine the duration, <laughs> the duration of risk factor exposure? And there are a few other things, but we'll be particularly talking about imaging, which has made further advances and will be making further advances and genetic testing. And the thing that's exciting about genetic testing was when we look at things like, uh, well, we'll show uh, two illustrative cases in a minute about, well, uh, and I'll come back to the, the, the genetic testing uh, with them. But first, as far as imaging, um, the calcium score we actually developed back in 1988, but until it could be done with all uh, multi-slice scanners, it, now, it's, now it's truly used all over the place. And so if this is a coronary artery and we're looking at plaque, it invariably starts at the beginning of the vessel and tracks down. And early plaque um, that's been there for a long time is large and dense. It didn't start that way, but um, if you're untreated and have diffuse disease, 
the old plaques are bigger and denser and the young ones are much smaller. So in that way, we could sort of always tell um, something about how long the disease had been there. And here, if we look at uh, two um, um, C CT angiograms showing calcium, um, before treatment, people would come a high calcium score. They'd say have a high, very high LDL. And this was the calcium we would see, mainly at the beginning of the vessel, uh, often high LAD. And the location doesn't really mean anything because uh, calcified uh, plaques are heal plaques. They're not going to kill you. Well, after treatment with the LDL down, when we continue to follow patients like this, um, after treatment, you don't see more plaques forming. And so this is one way to tell the age of the process. Um, with new technology, we're doing something we call carbon dating in a sense, because um, in the one we use now, it's, uh, it's clearly um, uh, uh, CT angiograms, and they look at the density of every pixel uh, in the scan. And so uh, all plaque starts as a vulnerable plaque with big, what I call a cholesterol pimple. And after plaque rupture, it starts to heal with scar tissue, which envelops the, uh, the cholesterol pimple. And eventually it's, it's all scar in a couple of years. And then you begin to calcify from, you know, even six months to a, a few years. And then over the years, the calcium gets larger. With the, uh, the what they, they, they call, um, um, you know, uh, machine, machine learning um, and or artificial intelligence, they classify mainly the fatty plaque um, as red, um, the scar as yellow, here it's still enveloping a little plaque, then all scar, and then you begin to calcify. In the early days, when we saw these large calcifications, we thought they were more obstructive, more dangerous, and you know maybe heading towards an intervention. Um, um, here is the, the, the blue, which is the calcium. We now need, know that the blue, the old plaque, the calcified plaque is just old versus young plaque. So if you're treating aggressively, you end up with all old, um, all old plaque and much less young plaque. So um, we're gonna look at two illustrative cases and see how this applies. Um, just two people with a phenotype with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, total cholesterol over 300, LDL greater than 190. And if you look at this 72 year old um, came in this past year with total cholesterol of 385 and uh, LDL cholesterol 285. So this is certainly um, looks like familial hypercholesterolemia, but calcium score a very low plaque burden. If this was there and she was exposed to this type of uh, of cholesterol for many, many years, you'd expect a lot more plaque. And in fact, um, when we when we did the GB insight, we found out that she was a hyperabsorber of cholesterol. She was uh, in ABCG5 heterozygous, and she in fact had been on a paleo diet and eating uh, six eggs a day. And with that, that's why she shot up cholesterol or cholesterol and looked like familial hypercholesterolemia uh, with the one time. But the calcium score showed us that um, she hadn't been exposed for that long. So we didn't give her a statin. We just told her to stop the eggs. And with that gene, her LDLs came down and she's not a problem. Um, with only a variation in her diet therapy cause of her particular uh, gene being a hyperabsorber of cholesterol. So she had actually short duration of exposure, low plaque burden, 
and explained by the ABCG5 uh, loss of, of function. Now, here's another interesting woman I've been uh, following, uh, you know, close to 30 years from the early, early 2000s. Um, and so she's, you know, has a bit of a belly, um, total cholesterol over 300, uh, LDL, this goes along with familial hypercholesterolemia. But she had a zero calcium score, essentially no plaque. And she didn't, she had taken statins when she first came with a zero score. We said, all right, we'll watch you off statins. If you have a zero score, you're not going to have an event. There, there are rare cases with thrombogenic issues. But we, we call uh, my colleague, Karim Nasser, introduced the idea of the power of zero. It's a very good prognosis. And so I assumed that she didn't have monogenic familial hypercholesterolemia because she didn't have any plaque. So we finally, once we had the opportunity, TB Insight, we looked and sure enough, she was a monogenic um, uh, LDL receptor, uh, autosomal dominant. So she was the typical mo classic monogenic um, hyper hypercholesterolemia. So she should have plaque. You know, what's what's going on? She has exposure for her whole life. Well, when we look beyond, she also had ABCA1 um, gain of function homozygous and it says, we'll see the ABCA1 starts reverse cholesterol transport, taking cholesterol out of foam cells, out of macrophages, and putting it in HDL, returning it to the liver. And so as much as she was dumping cholesterol into her, her, her macrophages, her foam cell in the vessel wall, the ABCA1 gain of function was taking it out and she never developed plaque. The issue was her, was, was family. So here's um, the 67, she's now 67. Um, we've been following again since she was in, in her 40s with that super high cholesterol and ABCA1, um, a gain of function for, for reverse cholesterol transport. Now, both her parents did die of infarcts and we presume that at least one of them had, well, had the FH gene, um, but they also had at least one ABCA1. So they had some protection, but not as much as, uh, as the daughter with homozygous ABCA1. So they had infarcts, but not early, like a typical monogenic um, yeah, uh, familial hybrid. Hyper, uh, hypercholesterolemia. And then her kids, it was very important if her kids, uh, particularly if, if they had the FH gene um, with, without, or, or just one ABCA1, um, you know, we, we want to make sure we treat them early. We're still going to follow them, but all three kids um, were negative uh, for the monogenic FH. And she's uh, homozygous for ABCA1, so they they all have some of the protected gene. Now we're going to go into something uh, maybe you're less familiar with, and that's H, uh, HDL physiology, which is complicated. And what we've learned is that high HDL, the so-called good cholesterol, is not always good. This is a recent study from the UK um, Biobank. I, I think it was you know, millions of patients. And low, and it was all-cause mortality. So a log of the hazard ratio, if you're low HDL, you're at increased risk. But when you're getting high over 80, um, your risk while it starts to go down as the HDL goes up, at this point, mortality goes up. So it's a U-shaped curve. So you can't count on a high HDL being protected. And I'll show you some of that physiology. HDL starts as apolipoprotein A uh, produced in the liver and in the uh, intestine. And 
it's lipidated to uh, HDL3, which is uh, the so-called small HDL. And that goes to the vessel wall and ABC, A1, LCAT, and there's some other um, uh, you know, hormones that, that also uh, lipidate the, H, uh, the HDL3. It becomes larger, which is HDL2. And then it goes to the liver where it hits the SRB1 receptor and dumps the cholesterol into the liver and then the liver dumps it in the intestine and that's reverse cholesterol transport. And then the HDL3 goes back and recycles. Okay, well, what if you're not making or there's an issue with SRB1 receptors? Uh, we've called them SRB1 receptors and the gene is, is SCAR uh, uh, B1. And so, if you're not attaching to SRB1 because there are fewer receptors, um, you're accumulating more cholesterol with a longer, uh, a longer residence time in the blood. The cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol becomes very large. And because it's large, it distorts the proteins on it. It doesn't fit in well to the SRB1 receptors that are there. And so it has a long residence time, less reverse cholesterol transport, and it an, becomes an atherogenic HDL. And this uh, partly explains some of the very high HDLs that are nevertheless not good for you and increase risk. So here's um, a, a, a fellow who at 59, because of a bad family history, had a calcium score and it was 980, very, very high for a 59 year old. And so, and he's a thin guy, um, may have a little insulin resistance, not much. And, and in fact, he has uh, SRB1 uh, uh, heterozygous uh, loss of function. So he has less reverse cholesterol transport and atherogenic HDL. And in fact, he's had fairly high HDLs over the years, um, but it obviously was not protecting him. One thing that we we do with advanced blood testing, uh, we started with uh, with methods that show the distribution of size of total uh, HDL and within the HDL. So this is gradient gel electrophoresis, which was uh, developed by uh, by uh, Dr. Ron Krauss uh, up at UCSF and popularized a lot by Dr. Robert Superco, who first taught me, taught me about it. And what we saw in this patient was instead of the large and the small HDL being about the same size, you got what I called the HDL 2B bump. Um, the uh, gradient gel electrophoresis was great, but it was on the expensive side. They developed a less expensive that pretty much does the same ion mobility, and it separates um, the HDL into just large and small. And so this is that patient's bump. And we treated him with a drug with phenofibrate, very common drug, very safe, and it actually upregulates SRB function. And with it, we chopped off his HDL bump, which we've done a lot. And it seems to have very, uh, very good results. And so, oops, um, and so we think we're doing a good job with him, but when we do the clearly CTA, we found almost all old plaque, no young plaque. And when we look at a summary, um, this is in his LAD, and you see all, all this blue and very little yellow and no red, no fat. Um, so he really had old plaque. And if you look, um, this is total of each of the vessels. And 
this is calcified plaque that's old and the calcium continues to occur even with the best of treatment your calcium score still goes up and what i call the scar the fibrous amount um actually goes down because you're um you're that's where the calcium is taking place so um where is my pointer? So, and so the calcium is much greater than the non calcified scar, and there's zero fat. So, this suggests that the treatment has been working. And he has a, a son who we screen because of the father. And at 44, um, he had a very high calcium score for age 44. Um, and um, and so suggesting he got some bad genes from his father, from, uh, from PS. He's got a little bit more belly, but in fact, he has the same SRB1. Um, he, got the, uh, he got the bad gene. Um, and, but his HDL is not all that high. Well, it turns out he has genes ApoA5 for high triglycerides, GNPD2 for obesity, homozygous. And when you have genes that are causing insulin resistance, high triglycerides, you know, obesity, um, you actually depress ABCA1. You don't have as high HDL. And so, so many people have what I call pseudo normalization of HDL. And so if they're diabetic, if they have high triglycerides, the HDL is not going to be high. You're not going to see the bump. And that's why it's so important to get the gene, because if they have if they have this gene, uh, they're in trouble. Now, because the son um, is younger, um, he has more relatively young plaque. Um, and so what we see here is his non-calcified plaque is greater than his calcified. That's because he's young. He still doesn't have any fatty plaque because we've just started treating him. It takes many years for many of these plaques to con uh, completely calcify, but in 20 years, he should be looking uh, like his dad with pretty much the same non-calcified but a lot more calcium. Um, so we really can tell the age of plaques. And in the family history, here's the primary uh, patient who's now 77 um, with the SRB1 um, heterozygous. And his father died at 52. He was never treated. It was a sudden death um, because he had you know, probably a very good HDL, not high cholesterol, and he wasn't recognized. Um, thanks to the imaging and the genetics, um, we recognized the son and he's being treated. And because of the calcium score and then the uh, SR, S, SRB1, we've been treating uh, the, the father uh, uh, for uh, uh, about 15 years now. Now, um, we an, another side of the HDL function is the LIPC, which is a gene for hepatic lipase, LIPG, uh, which is a gene for endothelial lipase. So these are lipases, but they mainly chew on HDL. And if you lose function, you get less transport of cholesterol from HDL to the liver. And we found this to be quite common. There are more genes that do this and we've, we've identified more genes. I just don't have time to show all the cases. So here's um, a, a woman who, when she was perimenopausal at 51, uh, because of a family history, um, she, we, we did a calcium score. Um, her father died at 51 of a heart attack. She was thin, 
she had um, total cholesterol, uh, total HDL initially, 108. So we think that's protective, but she's only perimenopausal and she has a score that she shouldn't have. And she has that HDL bump. The large HDL is really high. And so we, um, we look at her genetics and in fact, she has LIPC and she's homozygous for that, for hepatic li lipase gain of function, uh, law, I'm sorry, loss of function. She's homozygous for loss of function. So she has increased residence time of HDL. It's not being cleared uh, by the uh, uh, by um, the the receptors, and uh, and she has atherogenic um, HDL, which explains why she has a calcium score. She also had a gene for high LP little a, but her LP little a has always been normal. Now this is um, the son of of of, of SA, and because of the mother um, and the family history, uh, we looked at him um, much earlier than usual. In fact, at age 35, he had a calcium score of 61, which is quite high. And he also had a peak HDL of 112. He had the bump and he had calcium. And HDL, not very high, but thanks to the family history um, and the uh, imaging, we knew that he was uh, heterozygous for LIPC loss of function and that he already had plaque. But this is plenty of time to prevent progression. So again, early treatment and early identification is the key. Now, our primary patient essay, she also has a brother um, who was screened because of the family history um, when he was 53 and he had a quite high calcium score. His HDL was, uh, was you know, on the high side, but was not protective. He had a bump and with phenofibrate upregulating the function of SRB1, um, in fact, uh, we got, got rid of the bump. And here is the family, um, LIPC, um, homozygous loss of function. So here's our primary patient. So we know her parents um, were at least heterozygous for LIPC. Um, and the father who died at age 51, of course, um, was, 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 uh, was never treated. Um, and and went on to have an infarct. And whereas a primary patient, she's been treated and she's now 65 and doing well. And then there's the brother and the son, all of whom are heterozygous for loss of function of LIPC, but they've all been treated early and so far so good. Um, now here's, uh, uh, another family where um, the patient now is 77. He had a myocardial infarction at age 42. He went on a vegan diet for until he was 65 when he had typical angina and ended up with multivessel disease and the cabbage. Also with a very positive family history. Well, he's also homozygous uh, loss of function of LIPC. And so that seems to explain. Now we want to catch the kids. So his son at 36, we did a calcium score. Um, and we know he's, um, he's heterozygous, which he turned out to be. Um, not like his father, and he does already have calcium. His father had an infarct at 42 and would have had more calcium if we measured him at 36. So the 
the uh, the heterozygote LIPC it adds risk, um, but not as much risk as if you're homozygous loss of function. Now he's got a belly on his CT. This is visceral fat. He's insulin resistant, and that is depressing his total HDL by quite a bit. So he also has seronormalization. You wouldn't suspect the LIPC just from a high HDL. And here's um, this family where the primary patient who's now 77, but 42 had an infarct, um, homozygous, loss of function, LIPC. So we know his dad had an infarct and died at 62, his mom at 66. So again, they, um, they were not as bad as homozygous, but I, we, we've seen that the heterozygous is still, uh, still is pathogenic. So they had infarcts, not as, not as young as the son, and they were, they were never treated. It was many years ago. The brother, um, we don't have, well, he had a cabbage, and he's also, um, so he ran into trouble, although later than um, the, the, uh, uh, the primary patient who's homozygous, and the son is the one we looked at who has already calcium. And so, you know, these are all being treated, um, and some passed um, when their, their parents already had the infarcts, and uh, so... Hopefully that will be good. Um, now, here's a guy um, who came, he's actually a, a drug rep with type 2 diabetes, who, again, because of bad family history, had a calcium score, was off the wall high, 1227 for a fellow who's only 54 years old. And in fact, he was another homozygous loss of function LIPC. And he was also diabetic. He was diabetic. He had a belly. He had visceral fat and tons of coronary calcium. So all this is telling us he's had long exposure of dysfunctional HDL. And here's the summary. He's negative, never negative, uh, you know, homozygous loss of function. Um, but the father who had an infarct and died at uh, 52 and the mother at 70, and it's very similar. It's, it's, it's contributing risk. Um, and, um, and, and they certainly weren't treated, um, but they still had events probably later. Um, and now we've been treating this fellow for nine years. He's in early 60s. And, and doing well. And he has a daughter who we've not screened, but we should. And she's been out of, you know, out of town and not too cooperative. All right, now here's um, the LIPG is the hepatic lipase and the theolar lipase is LIPG, other is LIPC. And so um, this, woman um, had a calcium score early, but she came to me recently because of that huge calcium score. And in fact, she was LIPG um, heterozygous, like the uh, some of the LIPC heterozygous. So it's chewing on the HDL, but not doing reverse cholesterol transport. Um, but it, it seems like they're, they're something else must be going on. She, in fact, had a high HDL. Um, but when we did her uh, her CTA, the clearly CTA, we saw predominantly all these old, heavily calcified plaques. Um, a little scar, but not that much. And when we looked at the summary, again, a lot more calcified than non-calcified and no, no fat. So what's what's going on? How come she hasn't had an event? And she has a large plaque burden. Well, in her case, it turned out that she had a first calcium score in 2011 and was treated aggressively 
with both diet. She had been overweight. She did very, very, very well with diet and statin therapy as well. And um, we think her uh, SRB1 should be upregulated as well. So she has only old plaque due to aggressive treatment with diet exercise. And we've seen other people like that. We follow people 20 to 30 years and they all have this pattern if they've been treated um, successfully of calcium, not much scar or fibrous tissue and no fat. So we really can, in a sense, carbon date the age of plaques. And so, and these are all examples of why early treatment um, is really key uh, because it's these bad family histories, bad genes, a lot of plaque early um, that if you don't treat them, um, they'll be they'll be on this curve, the parents who weren't treated versus the kids with, with FH. And finally, um, some protective genes. I'm just gonna show you one case, um, 9B21, which is about endothelial function. If you're homozygous loss of function, we find that that's protective. BDNF, the brain-derived um, neutrotrophic factor, um, we see where that's been protective as well, and some other genes. So this is an interesting 61-year-old um, and high total cholesterol, high LDL cholesterol, um, an HDL of 117. So my gut is, especially when HDLs are that high, it's, it's, not, it's, um, it's not functional, it's dysfunctional, and they're going to have plaque. Um, and she has the bump. So expecting a really high score for her. And um, she's thin, she has very little visceral fat, good A1C, but she has an LP little a of 215. So here's another genetic marker, but she has a zero score. So what's going on? Well, she's like our FH patient. She's homozygous for ABCA1 gain of function. So she's increasing her reverse cholesterol transport and it's protective. Despite she has both high LP little a and her endothelial function, 9P21, homozygous gain of function. So she's overcoming um, really some big headwinds. Um, so my sense is this is really protective. And even if it's heterozygous, um, it's, um, it's protective. So these are just a lot of cases where the genetics, the imaging together, I didn't have time to show more of, of the uh, of insulin testing, which also tells us a lot about how long um, you've been exposed to, to, to bad diet. Um, and I think that's, um, I think that's, I think that's it. Okay, so that, that, that's wrap. So thank you, Dr. Agustin, so uh, for your presentation. Um, so once again, if you have any questions, you could type it into the Q&A box at the bottom, or you can use the raise hand option. So um, Dr. Agustin, there's a few questions. If you prefer to uh, look at the Q&A box and answer them directly, or I can moderate them. Um, why don't you tell me? Let me, should I, okay. I'll stop sharing the... Uh, okay, so... Will that help? Um, I don't know if... Uh, that's, okay, I, I, I can read them to you. Um, so here's from uh, Michael Gary. He says... I've been told we can't or maybe shouldn't do CCTA with clearly if calcium score is too high, greater than 800 or 8,000 or 1,000. Uh, but you showed a case where there was still a lot of useful info from the CCTA with clearly. So any thoughts on using CCTA with clearly? Yes. In general, with a calcium score alone, once you get over, you know, 100, really 200, 400, it's, it's not helpful. There's, uh, there's, there's, just too uh, too many artifacts. With the clearly, um, we found it helpful, and in particular, 
in patients that we start on treatment, we've been treating for 20, 30 years. They started with a lot of plaque. And by looking at the calcium scan alone, I, I could say, well, there are no new small plaques. Um, early on, you, you can do it that way, but not late on. And I've been, I've been using the clearly for that. And what we see is this ratio of very high old plaque to what I call younger plaques and no fatty plaques. And where certain people have been lost to follow up, we've seen all the combinations and permutations. So um, in, in fact, it was somebody over COVID, um, you know, they, they, some people had better diets over COVID. He, one guy had an event, he stopped taking everything and he had over a lot of old plaques, but he had a fatty plaque from, it was about two years of being lost to follow up and he developed a new plaque. So I have found it um, helpful. People that were we treated with phenofibrate, which is still off label, although a very safe, good drug. Um, we, um, I, you know, some stopped needing stents, not having chest pain. I said, I think you're doing well, but let's let's just make sure. And in the patients, like the first one I showed, um, uh, well, one was similar to him, but having stents every two years, um, and. Once we started him on phenofibrate and so, and he was on everything, um, but he had unrecognized HDL dysfunction. And he's uh, he was the, the first SRB1 issue that I showed. So now his, his son, and once you know that gene is there, that's when you want to look for kids really, really early. And starting even with diet and exercise, remember, um, you know, what we're showing is the gun is loaded. And if they're overweight, most Americans are not perfect when it comes to insulin sensitivity. So uh, the diet becomes important. And we can see people where they've started, stopped statins. They've been on a really great diet. We, we see that consistent um, with how fast they're progressing now that we, um, that we can really do what I call carbon dating. Uh, the, the, the plaques. Um, there's several questions, slight variations of the same theme about asking about treatment for HDL dysfunction specifically. There are a couple of questions about phenofibrate for SRB1 uh, loss of function. If you have any thoughts about that? or you well, that? Other than it, it is still off label. Um, I've reviewed the literature. It does improve SR, SRB1 um, function. It and clear and clearance. So with the SRB one patient, um, you know we've tried it. It seems it seems to work, um, but we have used it in the other causes of HDL dysfunction, and we've seen, as I showed one patient with that, where the bump was was chopped off. Um, obviously, when you know if you don't have um, if you don't have the, the 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 bump or the really high HDL, that's where you're really dependent on both family history and doing the genetics. So we we have people where there's a family history, um, and they and they do have the genes for LIPC, um, LIPG, sometimes homozygous. So we're starting them also. All I can say about phenofibrate because it's generic um they stop a lot of the studies and and but it's looking good in in people with high triglycerides low hdl it actually decreases microvascular problems as well as macrovascular and and it actually helps real function um sometimes creatinine goes up but it's not hurting renal function and um it's, it was shown to help with COVID. Um, whatever we tell the patients why we're using it off label, but we have quite a few we've we've followed for a long uh, a long time, and uh, it's it's been kind of dramatic. Now we're also lowering LDL you know aggressively in in those patients, and um, and using statins as well. But um, we've 
seen some people who after, um, you know, high dose statin um, still had an event. Um, that's what finally brought them to us. And the only thing we did was add uh, phenofibrate and that's uh, 15 years. And he has just old plaque. Okay. Um, there was another question kind of asking more broadly globally about HDL dysfunction and what sort of treatment options um, you kind of alluded to uh, just a minute ago about phenofibrate and statins. Um, is there anything else specific kind of more broadly um, that you would treat uh, with individuals who have perhaps other types of HDL dysfunction outside of SRV1? So now the, we've, we have used it for LIPC. Um, we've, uh, for LIPG, the hepatic lipase and endothelial lipase. And we, the, the area where we have examples of, I didn't have time to show with, with CTEP, um, where they've, you know, we, we have people with, uh, loss of function of cholesterol ester transfer protein who have super high HDLs, um, and, some with disease, some without. Obviously, uh, in the clinical trials, it hasn't paid out. And, and we've seen several with um, both loss of function and gain of function. And I'm still confused from the clinical trials and our small experience with it. Um, but, um, and, and the other thing is, is it, it is so important to do the genetics. The last patient I showed had a bump had um, you know very high HDL, but it was due to just ABCA1 protein dumping uh, cholesterol from macrophages into the HDL, and so and some people with very high HDLs are protected, and you can tell with the imaging, but you can tell with the genetics, and especially um, for the kids because if kids are high risk, we don't. Uh, unless there's really bad family history, you won't image until at least the 30s. And usually men after 40 and women uh, post-menopausal. And so you you can certainly get the LDL. We would be more aggressive um, with LDL lowering if for some reason they can't tolerate phenofibrate. And we use it with, um, with phenofibrate as well, the statins plus phenofibrate. But the, the one thing I'll say is HDL function is much more common than people seem to think. And everybody has an occasional case. We, we must have you know, 50, 60, 70 cases. We see it all the time. And our internists who look for it um, see it all, all the time. And when it's high, it's almost, most of the time it's path, pathogenic, but not always. And that's where the genes are really are really helping us out. I think this could be our last one. Um, it says, do you see a potential benefit for using semaglutide or other GLP-1 receptor agonists for insulin resistance or other factors of high calcium? Um, yes, I mean, we don't have really long-term stuff, but the, the GLP agonists or that with GIP antagonists, um, that um, I mean, we know we know how they work, and in we're very aggressive with with diet, um, depending on the patient, intermittent fasting, and and uh, you know, uh, really very very strict keto type um, in in some depending on on the overall risk, but some people are just don't follow diet and. Uh, we, you know, for those, um, um, so far I'm optimistic about the GLP agonists and, and GIP antagonists. And then there are new ones, uh, you know, coming out. So we don't, the way it's used for anybody who gains a little weight is one thing, but diabetics who, you know, are not coming around. And if you don't, if there's a lot of insulin resistance, uh, that's that's really that's really important. Remembering that the genes load the gun, but if your diet is perfect, um, like the Maasai in Africa, who are essentially ketogenic and don't get any coronary disease.
Yeah, well, uh, Dr. Agassin, I want to just thank you again and really appreciate your time and uh, your presentation. Um, and, and thanks to all the participants and the attendees for uh, for joining. Um, so we're going to bid you farewell. And thanks again, Dr. Agassin. Thank you very much, Mendel. Enjoy it. All right. Thanks for everybody.